All right. If you have your Bibles, John 8 is where we're going to be. John 8. We're back in our study in the Gospel of John. Last week we looked at the story of the adulterous woman and saw that Jesus that we serve is a caring person, is a caring God. Um, and as we study the book of John, um, our intention as we study this book, as we go through section by ch section, chapter by chapter, is specifically to look at who Jesus is. What does this text teach us about Jesus? And so with that focus, we've been looking at passage by passage. And this morning, we're going to be looking um, at John chapter 8, verses um, 12 to 30. That title is wrong, and that's totally my fault. Um, the, pa the title this morning is Jesus is... Um, the light. Jesus is the light. And so um, John 8 verses 12 to 30. Let me give you a little glimpse into my mind, into my head as I prepare sermons, um, as, I, as I prepare um, how I come to sermon preparations. Preaching is something that's very intriguing. It's very interesting to me. Um, I am a pastor's kid, both sides, um, grandparents were pastors, and the last thing I ever thought I would be doing in my life was standing in front of people and preaching. I, in fact, um, I grew up in an Indian Pentecostal church, and um, if you're familiar with Pentecostal churches, preachers can get fiery and preachers can get animated, and so I would come home and I would make fun of preachers that would preach it, so I, and I would, um, I would be the one that would be sitting there mocking them. My parents would yell at me and saying that I was being disrespectful, and yet here I am, I stand, and I don't know if, if you guys go home and make fun of me, um, but, uh, but <laughs> what do I feel like some of you do? Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, if you do, you might end up on stage one day. Just be careful. So uh, here I stand today, um, a product of sheer grace. I'm just one beggar telling the rest of you beggars where grace is. You need to know that um, this preaching up here isn't easy for me. Um, I've been doing this now for like 10 years. And like that last song before I got to get up here, I'm shaking. I mean, even now, I'm still nervous. Last week, I don't know if you guys came out to that community event. If you watch the video, my legs are shaking as I'm standing there in front of people. Um, this is not something I'm, I enjoy doing in the sense of like, man, I would rather sit there and listen to someone else speak. And yet it's exhilarating. It's joyful because I know that this is what God has called me to do. And yet in our culture today, preaching is viewed as some archaic form of communication. Even people in the church see it as a necessary evil, right? Something that has to be done that they hope could be done quickly. That never, gets, that never happens here. Um, in many ways, modern preaching has taken on the rhythm of modern music, of pop music. Randall Roberts is a pop music critic for the LA Times. He wrote many years ago that pop music changed because of people's short attention spans. He said, it was unmarketable if the songs went longer than five minutes. He said, a pop song should present itself, it should explain itself, and just in case you missed the point, it should repeat itself, and it should surprise you for maybe a second or two, and then it should be done. But the problem that he found was in doing that, the artists lost their audience. They tune out from the redundancy, from the lack of depth from the songs. Jerome Harmon, a.k.a. J-Rock, the music producer, commenting on how many are attempting to change uh, this pop music culture. They said conversation pieces. That's what people want. They want to talk about it. They want to hear the story. And Roberts continued that the successful songs of our culture have offered gravitas, has offered weightiness, something in it. And as I come in front of sermon prep, that's what I hope for, is that gravitas is what we're after here, Sunday after Sunday. My goal is not to do a small homily on some subject matter or a cultural topic. My goal, my prayer, is that at the end of each sermon, you would see Jesus. 
That's my desire in every sermon. Preaching can be empowering, life-changing. It can be engaging, but it also can be destructive, hopeless, crippling. And I'm not speaking about how it's presented, homiletics. I'm talking about the content. If you don't get to Jesus in a sermon, then it leaves you without power, without hope, without the gospel. Charles Spurgeon used to say that if you hear a real sermon, it would always direct you to look at Jesus. You see, the gospel is not just the ABCs of Christianity. It's not just the entrance into Christianity. It's not, hey, you got this, and now it's because you got this, let's dive into deeper stuff and leave the gospel behind. The gospel is not just the ABCs. Tim Keller would say it's the A through Z of Christianity. You many think that the gospel is for unbelievers, and then when you're saved, now it's time to dive into deeper things, harder things, push in and leave the gospel behind. They think the gospel is the front porch, that once you enter in, you leave that behind. But guys, the gospel is not the front porch of Christianity. The gospel is the entire house. It's everything. We are saved by believing the gospel. We are transformed by believing the gospel. And we dive deeper into grace by believing the gospel. Do you remember those pictures of like optical illusions where if you stare at something long enough into a random picture, eventually another image comes out and you're, well, once you get cross-eyed? I mean, those pictures, that's what we're trying to do with every text that we dive in, that we want to see Jesus in the text. And can I be honest, he is what every one of us needs to see week in and week out. See, the reason this is true is that even after we become followers of Jesus, our default is to go back to religion. Religion says, hey, I'm going to obey. I'm going to do stuff. And because oh, I obey, God will accept me. Martin Luther said that this was the deep default of the human heart. And every day you wake up and this is your default. You want to do stuff to get approval. But the gospel is the exact opposite. The gospel says... I'm accepted by Jesus. He has approved me. He has accepted me. Therefore, I obey. Therefore, I do everything that I do. Religion will only lead us to fear. It will lead us to pride. It will lead us to weakness in the Christian life. But the gospel will lead us to humility, to boldness, to power. The gospel is power. 1 Corinthians 2 says that, For I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. You see, the reason that we don't give generously, the reason that we worry, the reason that we get anxious, the reason that we're mean, the reason that we're racist is not because we're failing to live right or we lack the power to do things. It's a failure to believe the gospel. It's a failure to rejoice in what Jesus has done. It's a failure to have your identity and satisfaction in Jesus and Jesus alone. Back in Galatians Peter was meeting a group of believers, Jews and Gentiles, and his natural inclination was to discard the Gentiles and sit with the Jews. And um, he was, even though he was a leader of the church, he was being racist. And Paul confronts Peter in Galatians 2. And Paul doesn't confront Peter and he says, hey, Peter, stop being racist. Paul confronts Peter and says, Peter, you stopped believing the gospel. The reason you're racist is because you didn't believe that the gospel has made us equal, has made us one. And Paul confronts Peter because of that. And listen, that's always the reason why you and I sin. It's a faith issue more than it's a deeds issue. You fall into sin because you don't believe that God is good, God is satisfying, God is your provider. This is why Paul said to fight the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy. You see, the problem's with fear, with shame, with guilt, which drive our emotions is a problem with believing some lie about God and what he has done for you in Jesus. It is always a failure to believe the gospel. And thus the solution isn't stop gossiping, isn't stop lying, it isn't stop being greedy, it isn't stop being racist, but it's repent of believing that human approval is more valuable than God's approval. 
It's repent of not believing the gospel. Repent of believing that money and affluence is going to deliver you from guilt, from shame, from fear. Repent from that and turn to Jesus and believe what Jesus says about you. And thus, in whatever passage of Scripture we're in, we have to get to Jesus. And in doing so, we grow in our faith. We grow in sanctification. We find the solution for our fight against sin is the gospel. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you get to hear the gospel every week from different perspectives, from different chapters, and get to see how it works and plays out in the life of a follower of Jesus. And this way, you walk out of here every Sunday with hope that you can face guilt and shame and fear because you see that Jesus is marvelous, he's worthy, and because he is marvelous and you are in awe of him, you leave and you live the life of pursuing Jesus. Listen, if I just pick up a passage and preach it, telling you what to do, to do what it says, telling you to do what it says, and you don't get to see Jesus out of it, you'll walk out of here guilty and unchanged and maybe lost and hopeless. You may change for a day or two because of guilt, but it's not glorifying to God and it's not permanent change. I believe change can occur right where you're seated as you encounter God, as you encounter Jesus. That's worship. This is why every week we reflect and take communion every Sunday to remind us of Jesus. That means the essence of every sermon should be more about Jesus than it is about us. We see the Bible as being about Jesus and what he did more than it about being us, about us and what we can do. It's not that Jesus is a good example for us or that he is loving and we should follow that, but we should see him as Savior. We should see him as Lord. We should see him as our treasure, as our joy, as our delight. And when we do that, we pursue him. That makes the essence of every sermon something like this. What we have to do, why we can't do it, how Jesus did it, and how through him and because of him we are now able to do it. And that's what we're going to see in our passage today as we look at this text where Jesus proclaims to the world that he is the light. So John 8, 12 to verse 30. So we're going to look at several things. The first thing that we're going to see is we must follow Jesus. This is what we have to do. We must follow Jesus. And so this passage is spoken in the context of of the Feast of Tabernacles. The feast is about to end, and according to verse 20, Jesus was in the court of the women in the treasury department, which included only male and female Jews. No Gentiles were allowed there. This was the busiest part of the temple, and it contained 13 treasure chests. These treasure chests were shaped like trumpets. Each of these chests were designated for certain offerings. Nine were required offerings that the people would have to give. Four were voluntary offerings that the people would have to give. And some of you complain about one offering every week, right? Um, and th they had 13 of these. And in this space, in this area, there were two great ceremonies at the Feast of Tabernacles that took place. One was the drawing and the pouring out of water. We looked at that when we looked, studied John 7. The other was when the temple was illuminated, the lights came on, which takes place here in John 8. One was a daytime celebration. The other was an all-night celebration, and that's where the party really started. And in the center of this area were four great menorahs or torches or candelabras. Some would say the torches were as high as the highest walls of the temple. Now, the temple doors itself were 100 feet, so um, the temple was even higher, and the menorahs were high there. And on top of these golden menorahs were great bowls that held 65 liters of oil. And there's one, there's a ladder there. The priest that had the gym membership would climb that ladder and go all the way to the top, and he would uh, light, the, light the candle. Um, light the flames, and the flames would illuminate the entire temple, and all of Jerusalem would see it. Each night, the priests, the band would kick off, and dancing would commence. Think about um, New Year's Eve in New York City. That, picture that, right? And that's what's happening in the temple during this feast, celebration. They would party till dawn, celebrating the pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness in the Old Testament. And after all of this was over, the festivities had concluded. Jesus stands up in the middle of the crowd, and he says the following, verse 12. 
Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, in our study of John, in John 6, we saw that Jesus was, calls himself the bread, the bread of life, or manna. In John 7, Jesus calls himself living water. And here in John 8, Jesus calls himself light. Bread, manna, water, and light. All three are imageries from the people walking in the wilderness. All three were images from the wilderness period. And when Jesus says he's the light of the world, he wasn't talking about the sun. He was talking about the pillar of cloud and fire that led the Jewish people through the wilderness from Egypt. And he commands that they follow him. Jesus looks at the people and says, follow me. Follow the pillar of cloud and fire that's standing in your midst. And so Jesus, if Jesus is the pillar of, a pillar of cloud and fire, then what does that tell us about him? couple things. Number one, he's a guardian. Back in the Old Testament, the Jewish people would camp out when the cloud of fire would stop and they would move when the cloud would move. Every time the cloud moved, they would move. Every time the cloud stopped, they would cl stop. Every time the fire moved, they would move. Every time it stopped, they would stop. Sometimes Numbers talks about it. Sometimes they would stay for long, long periods of times. Other times they would be like, they'd get there, they'd rest the next morning. The cloud was always moving. But whenever the cloud moved, the people would move. Whenever the cloud stopped, the people would stop and they would wait. So it was a guardian over them. The cloud also served as a cover or guardian. The wilderness would get up to 110 degrees during the day and it would be freezing at night. The cloud provided covering from the sun and the fire provided heat during the night. So don't, when you picture this, don't picture like one little piece of cloud in the sky. Picture a cloud that can cover six million people. It's a massive, miraculous cloud covering the people in the sky. Psalm 105 says, He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. And the world, like that wilderness, is dark. It's dangerous. Enemies are there trying to harm you, to attack you. Sin tries to kill you. The world will try to lure you in, to trap you. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour you, to destroy you. And when Jesus says he is the light and to follow him, he is saying, hey, if you follow me, then I will be your guardian. I will be your keeper. I will be your protector. Let me remind you of the words from the psalmist, Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills where does my help come? from my hope comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth he will not let my foot be moved he will not let my he will not he, he keeps me will not slumber behold he who keeps Israel will not slumber nor sleep the Lord is my keeper the Lord is the shade at my right hand the sun is not going to strike me by day the moon will not strike me by night the Lord is going to keep me from all evil he will keep my life the Lord will keep me from my going in and my coming out from this time forth and forevermore he's saying I'm going to guard you I'm going to protect you I'm going to be your keeper he says if you will follow me I'll guard you I'll keep you I'll protect you but not only is he our guardian he's also our guide the cloud and fire kept them wandering around clueless wandering into hostile territory. They would only follow wherever the cloud went. As long as they followed the light, as long as they followed the, crowd, the, the cloud, as long as they didn't re rebel against God, they would reach the promised land of Canaan. And when Jesus says that he is the light and to follow him, he's saying, if you would follow me, listen, I will guide you. I'll lead you. I'll direct you. I will order your steps. That doesn't mean that you will not suffer. That doesn't mean you won't go through hardships, but he will guide you in the midst of that. If you go back and read Exodus 13, you'll find that God had equipped them for battle when they left for Egypt, but he still led them into battles. He led them into times where it was difficult. As the light, Jesus will guide you with understanding, with truth. He clears up dark and clarifies confusion so that you no longer walk in darkness blind to the realities of sin in your life, the tricks of the devil, the deceitfulness of the world. Isaiah 42, God promises, I will lead 
the blind in a way that they don't know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things that I will do. I will not forsake them. He will be our guardian. He will be our guide. He'll be glory, number three. When Jesus says that he's the light, he's saying the Shekinah glory of God, the same presence that would fill the temple when they, when, when they completed the temple is that same glory. I will be for you. The glory there, that word means weightiness or heaviness, gravitas. Jesus is saying that he is the answer to all our questions, the satisfaction to our thirst. Then this is what I am. This is what John meant by calling Jesus the word, logos, in John 1. He is the reason. He is the answer for what they've been longing for. Look at verse 14. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. Where did I come from? Where am I going? And these are two basic philosophical questions that every one of us asks. Jesus says, listen, I have the answers to the basic questions of life. We only know ourselves and our mission when we find our identity in Jesus. We only know what we are created for when we find our identity in Jesus. Listen, if your identity isn't in Jesus, then you will continually wonder who you really are, what you're meant to do, and where you're going. To know Jesus is to truly know. To see Jesus is to truly see. He is the glory. He is our hope. He's our answer. He's our reason. Number four, we discover that he's God. Look at verse 15. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Jesus says, listen, I'm not like you. You judge based on outward appearance and partial information. I don't judge like that because I go deeper. I know the heart. I have all information. We saw that in, in how Jesus dealt with the adulterous woman. Jesus says he will judge in the future and be thankful it's not now. He will return and judge, and he will do so with his other witness, the Father. And so the people didn't like this, and they mocked Jesus. Look at verse 17. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I'm the one who bears testimony about, who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And when the Jews are asking Jesus, where's your father? They're mocking him. They're ridiculing him. They're saying, oh, who is this father of yours? That's right. No one really knows who your father is. They're accusing Mary, the mother of Jesus, of sleeping around with so many men that she didn't even know who the father was. That's why in verse 41, they say they're, they weren't born of sexual immorality. And so Jesus gets them straight. He, they don't know God because they don't follow Jesus. To know Jesus is to know God because Jesus is God. So this is who Jesus is. He is our guide. He's our guard. He's our glory. He's our God. And you must follow him or you're still going to be in darkness. But here's the problem. No one follows Jesus. Everyone walks in darkness. John 3 says it this way. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. People love the darkness more than they love the light because our deeds are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. We would rather be in darkness than in the light. You see, in the wilderness, the whole generation that came out of Egypt died except for Joshua and Caleb because they, follow, they failed to follow the light. They fail to follow God. And instead of being a guard, Jesus becomes an attacker. Instead of being a guide, Jesus becomes a prosecutor. Instead of being their glory, he becomes their judge. And instead of being their God, he becomes their executor. This is because they refused 
to follow the light of the world. All of these promises are void if we refuse to follow Jesus. So here's the problem. Point number two, you can't follow Jesus. Jesus tells them all this, and then he tells us why we can't follow him and that why we're in darkness. Look at verse 21. He said to them again, I'm going away, and you will see, seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So this is like the end of chapter 7. He says, hey, I'm going home. He says, you'll seek me, you'll desire me, you will want to find me, and in your searching, you're not going to find me because you're searching in darkness. I'm going to be with the Father in heaven, and you're not going to be able to follow me because of your sin. He literally says, you don't have the power or strength to come where I'm going. Sin will cripple you and make you unable to come to Jesus on your own. This is why he says twice in John 6, these words, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. He says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Verse 22. So the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come? Notice, notice why they won't follow him. Self-righteousness. They believed a person who kills himself went to hell, which, by the way, that's not in the Bible. And they assumed that Jesus must be talking about hell because, of course, we're going to heaven. Look at, look at all of our good deeds. Look at all of our righteousness. We are going to heaven based on how well we do because of how good we are. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to be with the Father. The implication is that religious, self-righteous people will not follow Jesus into heaven. It's because they turned the Bible on its head. They see it about it, the Bible is about being for, about them and what they can do instead of about being about God for what he has done for them. And maybe this morning you sit here and you say, yeah, those religious, self-righteous people, and now Jesus turns to you, verse 23, and he says to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. He says, here's another reason you're not going to be able to enter in. It's because you're more in love with this world then you are in love with Jesus. Some people are in love with appearing moral and good, while others are in love with appearing well-to-do and liked and cool. Both groups, though, religious, irreligious, love something else more than Jesus. These guys love the applause of men. They love the approval of men, and Jesus made that clear in the Gospels. And that's so true even for us in our culture. We would rather have the approval and the applause of other people instead of the approval and the applause of Jesus. We would rather have people accept us and approve us rather than say, hey, I'm not going to be able to do some things that you do because my, my relationship with Jesus is much more important. We would rather get accepted by people instead of live for Jesus. But both the religious leaders and the irreligious people Jesus says, cannot follow me because they desire something other than me. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Jesus again repeats this impossibility of following him. You can't access me. You can't come to me for one fundamental reason. Because you don't have faith. You have no desire to want me above every other thing. Notice that sin now in this verse has been changed to the word sins. Again, the fundamental reason you commit outward and inward sins is because you fail to believe the gospel. You fail to identify, you find your identity in Jesus. It's always a faith issue before it's a deeds issue, before it's a works issue. To pursue something other than Jesus is to make it your God and thus make you no different from the ancient Egyptians in the Exodus. He says, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. And they knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew he was saying he is God, just as Moses heard the day by the burning bush. And by the end of the chapter, we'll discover that they're going to try to kill Jesus because of this. See, what we've seen thus far in our text is that we who are living in this dark, 
world must follow Jesus, who is a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. But what we find out is we can't follow him because of our sin, and we're no different from the guys wandering around in the wilderness who end up dead with their bodies scattered throughout the desert. Our situation is bleak, and left in this condition as an unbeliever, you will die in your sin, and you will end up in hell. And I'm not here to water that down to you today. My job as a pastor is to love you enough to tell you the truth. And as a believer, if you don't see your need for grace, your need for the gospel, your need for Jesus daily in your life, what will happen is you will live in fear, you will live in shame, you will live in powerless, uh, powerless in your fight against sin. And you and I, we need the gospel this morning. We need to be reminded that we need Jesus. Third point. There is a way to follow Jesus. Just like God used Moses to split the Red Sea, so Jesus now parts the darkness to make a way to follow him. Jesus sees their predicament, and he sees our predicament, and he turns to the only good news that will change us, the only message that will transform us. He presents the gospel. You see, you need to follow Jesus, but you can't follow Jesus. But Jesus followed God perfectly, and now because he died for you, you can follow him. Verse 28, Jesus said to him, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, that I do nothing by my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. The lifting up of Jesus here is a reference that's going to take place six months from now. It's exactly what Jesus said back in John 3 when he said, If you lift me up, I will draw all men to me. You see, Jesus spoke perfectly. He spoke just as the Father. He acted perfectly. He did the things that were pleasing to God. He, everything he said was perfect. Everything he did was perfect. No one has discovered words of Jesus that ought to have been said or deeds of Jesus that ought to have been done. The quality of his words and the quality of his work was outstanding. He left people speechless in scriptures. And just a few days before this, the guards wanted to try to arrest him, but they returned empty-handed, not because Jesus was too strong or because Jesus had an army or because Jesus was just powerful, but because Jesus amazed them by his life and his character and his words. Jesus followed the Father with absolute perfection, something you and I would never be able to do, and he had to be lifted up. Your sin had to be removed. The curse had to be lifted. The sin had to be paid for. Jesus is not just a good example for you and I to follow. He is a God who came to redeem us and pay the penalty for yours and my sin. And we need to let that sink in daily. In six months from this text, Jesus will ascend a hill with a wooden cross on his back and be suspended by three nails to die a gruesome death. We, will call, we call this day Good Friday, but that day wasn't good for Jesus. While the gospel tells us of all the physical and the pains of the cross, Psalm 22 tells us the emotional nature of the cross. Let me read Psalm 22 to you. This is a prophecy about Jesus on the cross. He says, I'm a worm, not a man. Scorned by mankind, despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in God, they say, he says. Let, him, let God deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Verse 12 of Psalm 22 says, Many encompass around me. Strong bowls of bastion surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving, roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up. My tongue sticks to my jaw. You lay me in the dust for death. Dogs surround me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They stare, they gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, for I am 
For my clothing they cast lots. Listen, as a result of the death of Jesus, you and I can now live. As a result of being made sin, you and I are now free and clean. As a result of Jesus following the Father perfectly, even to death, you and I can now follow Jesus even though we stumble and even though we fall. You are still, when the Father looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus and he sees you as perfect. Look at verse 29. Here we see how we can follow Jesus. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed him. People became followers of Jesus. This was only made possible because of what Jesus would do in about six months from this day. The amazing grace of God is this. Because God treated Jesus as if he should have lived your life or my life, he now treats us as if we lived the life of Jesus. That's grace. If God had treated us the way we deserve, none of us would be able to worship this morning. None of us would even be here this morning. The reason we're here, the reason we can worship, the reason we can sing is because when God looks at you and me, he treats us the way Jesus should have been treated. But because Jesus was treated the way you and I should have been treated, now we are treated the way Jesus should be treated. Let that sink in. God says, I love you not because of how good you are. I love you because Jesus took your price. God says, I give you grace. I'm your guide. I'm your protector. I'm your guardian. I'm your glory. I'm your God. Not because you came to the table with all this stuff. I, I'm your guide. I'm your guardian. I'm your God. I'm your glory because Jesus took your place. And now I lavish my love on you. The love that was really only Jesus deserved, I give to you. Would you let that sink in? Notice Jesus says here that the Father is with him and has not left him alone. Jesus is referring to the many occasions where he would at moments notice look at a moment's notice look to heaven and talk with the Father. It was this ongoing, constant contact and conversation that Jesus would have with the Father. Jesus would, oftentimes we'd see in Scripture, he would escape to the mountains away from the crowd and have these sweet times of intimacy with the Father, just as he's done for all eternity. Twice the Father would yell from heaven. He would say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, once by a river and once in a mountain. For eternity, Jesus had enjoyed perfect fellowship, communion with, and joy with the Father. But because of our sin, he was left alone, all alone on that day on the cross. On the cross, the voice of the Father would go mute. And just like the psalmist in Psalm 22, Jesus would frantically look up at the sky and say, But God, don't be far off. You, my help, come, be my aid, deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog, save me from the mouth of lions. And God wouldn't respond. Matthew 27, in the ninth hour, Jesus cries out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? For that moment on the cross, Jesus frantically looks up to the sky, awaiting to hear from the Father. The Father who's gladly spoke over him over and over during his years on earth. But this time Jesus calls him and there's no response. Where are you? Don't leave me. And for the first time, and for the last time, when he spoke, 
nothing happened. Just a horrible, endless silence. The father doesn't answer. The father turns away from his boy, and Jesus was left all alone, abandoned, left for dead. We lose, you and I, we lose an acquaintance, we're sad. We lose a friend, it hurts worse. We lose a loved one. It's hard to recover from that pain. But Jesus' relationship with the Father was timeless. It was beginningless. He was intimate with the Father from eternity to eternity. And for this moment, Jesus looks up and the Father isn't responding. You see, while the Father had not left Jesus alone, six months later, he would. And wouldn't it be because somehow Jesus has stopped doing the things that please the Father Instead, it would be because you failed to do, you and I failed to do what was pleasing to the Father. See, we're the reason this took place. We are the cause that Jesus was abandoned. Why did the Father turn his back? Because Jesus became sin for us, and God judged Jesus like he would judge us forever, which is separation from him forever in hell. Tears roll down the face of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. The face that of the one who would one day wipe every tear from every eye who believes in him. Now tears are rolling down his eyes. This was the only way that God could destroy sin without destroying you and I. It's the only way that God's glory, which is our greatest joy, which is our greatest good, which is our greatest delight, what we are made to enjoy forever could be made available to us. My friends, the gospel, the good news that the door is open, the gate has been swung wide open to you so that you and I can follow Jesus. Because he was left alone for your sin at that moment, the promise is you and I will never be left alone. If you know Jesus, if you love Jesus, listen to the words of Scripture. Joshua 1, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I am with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Matthew 28, I am with you till the end of this age. His promise is that because I abandoned Jesus, the promise is he will never, ever, ever leave us. No matter where you are in your life, no matter how hard you're struggling, God will never leave you. No matter how difficult your situation is right now, He's not abandoning you. No matter how hard life may be, He's right there with you. Listen, Jesus faced the ultimate separation and bore your hell and my hell. And the greatest enemies have been defeated. Death has no more sting. Satan is a defeated foe. And sin's damning effect has been disarmed. Goliath is dead. David has The greater David has defeated him. Let that security give you strength to fight the enemies that you are facing. Let that joy empower you to resist temptation this week. And keep following close to Jesus because he has won the battle for you. He has. As we go to communion this morning, meditate on that truth. If you're struggling with sin this week, meditate on that. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is glorious. And the reason you're struggling is because you are not in awe and wonder and worship of Jesus. And you need to get back there. You need to get back to where you see Jesus as your true joy, true treasure. You need to let this sink in. The reason you're struggling in your devotions, the reason you're struggling in your faith is because you haven't really caught the gospel. Some of you here this week in, week out, you, and you've almost become numb to this. And my prayer for you is that you never become numb to the gospel. That we never graduate from being in awe and wonder of the fact that we shouldn't be here, but because Jesus took our place, we 
are forgiven. We are cleansed. We are part of the family of God. God doesn't look at us and call us enemies or outcasts or strangers or aliens, but he looks at us this morning and he says, son. He looks at us this morning and he says, daughter. He says, beloved. He says, friend. May we never graduate from that. As we come to the table this morning, I invite you to reflect on that truth. Reflect on what Jesus went through to give you this incredible standing with God, this incredible door that has been opened for you so that you can follow Jesus. And then I invite you to repent of your pace. Repent of how slow you are in following Jesus. Repent of how sin and apathy and laziness has slowed you down and resolve this morning that you would pick up the pace, that you would take up the cross, that you would follow close behind Jesus, that you would pursue pursue Jesus, that you would be in love with Jesus, and you would, in that pursuing and in that um, loving, that you would be empowered to live for Jesus. See, this is where power comes from, to follow Jesus. This is the gospel. And whether you've been a follower of Jesus for 40 years, or you've been a follower of Jesus for 30 minutes, we never graduate from this. We need this week in and week out. As we come to the table this morning, would you examine your heart, your attitudes, your actions, your motives? Examine where you are in following Jesus. Has the joy, the awe, the wonder of the cross, is it still there for you? If not, this morning, would you repent? Would you run to him? Would you pursue him?